Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Um, we're going to do the second day of our read aloud. Hopefully we'll be able to finish this chapter. I think the chapters are a little bit longer, but that's okay. Um, I'm super excited for this fun Friday. Um, some of you have already started sending me your projects. I've seen videos. I've seen slideshows. I've seen um, physical projects. I'm so excited to see what you guys come up with and I hope you join us on the Zoom call at 1030 to share what you've worked on with your classmates. Um, also in our agenda today I included some activities for you to do um, for Mother's Day. Mother's Day is on Sunday and we want to make sure that we celebrate our moms at home. So make sure you find some time today or tomorrow to do something special for your mom. Make her a card. Um, there's some paper flower ideas. Do something nice for her. Um, I gave you some ideas in the agenda, so I hope you take a look at it. All right, so we started the book off yesterday. Um, and we're just kind of getting an idea of the area that Gail and uh, Gail and um, Katniss live in. Um, we know that they're in District 12. We know they're in an area that is very um, restricted by the government, um, where they're not even allowed to leave the gates, but they sneak out to hunt for food, um, and they sell that food to better provide for their families on kind of like a black market type thing. Um, so we also know that they are preparing for the reaping today. As we walk, I glance over at Gail's face, still smoldering underneath his stony expression. His rage seems pointless to me, although I never say so. It's not that I don't agree with him. I do. But what is good? what good is yelling about the capital in the middle of the woods? It doesn't change anything. It doesn't make things fair. It doesn't fill our stomachs. In fact, it scares off the nearby game. I let him yell, though. Better he does it in the woods than in the district. Gail and I divide our spoils, leaving two fish, a couple of lo loaves of good bread, greens, a quart of strawberries, salt, paraffin, and a bit of money for each. See you in the square, I say. Wear something pretty, he says flatly. At home, I find my mother and sister are ready to go. My mother wears a fine dress from her apothecary days. Prim is in my first reaping outfit, a skirt and ruffled blouse. It is a bit big on her, but my mother has made it stay with pins. Even so, she's having trouble keeping the blouse tucked in in the back. A tub of warm water waits for me. I scrub off the dirt and sweat from the woods and even wash my hair. To my surprise, my mother has laid out one of her own lovely dresses for me, a soft blue thing with matching shoes. Are you sure? I ask. I'm trying to get past rejecting offers of help from her. For a while, I was so angry. I wouldn't allow her to do anything for me, and this is something special. Her clothes from her past are very precious to her. Of course, let's put your hair up too, she says. I let her towel dry it and braid it up on my head. I can hardly recognize myself in the cracked mirror that, that leans against the wall. You look beautiful, says Prim in a hushed voice. And nothing like myself, I say. I hug her because I know these next few hours will be terrible for her. Her first reaping. She, she's about as safe as you can get since she's only entered once. I wouldn't let her take out any tesserae, but she's worried about me, that the unthinkable might happen. I protect Prim in every way I can, but I'm powerless against the reaping. The anguish I, feel, I always feel when she's in pain wells up in my chest and threatens to register on my face. I notice her blouse is pulled out of her skirt in the back again and force myself to stay calm. Tuck your tail in, little duck, I say smoothing the blouse back in place. Prim giggles and gives me a small quack. Quack yourself, I say with a light laugh, the kind only Prim can draw out of me. Come on, let's eat, I say, and I plant a quick kiss on the top of her head. The fish and greens are already cooking in a stew, but that will be for supper. We decide to save the strawberries and bakery bread for this evening's meal, to make it a special, we say. Instead, we drink milk from Prim's goat, lady, and eat the rough bread made from the tesserae grain, although no one has much of an appetite anyway. At one o'clock we head for the square. Attendance is mandatory unless you are on a death door. This evening officials will come around and check to see if this is the case. If not, you'll be imprisoned. It's too bad, really, that they hold the reaping in the square, one of the few places in District 12 that can be pleasant. 
The square is surrounded by shops and on public market days, especially if there's good weather, it has a holiday feel to it. But today, despite the bright banners hanging on the buildings, there's an air of grimness. The camera crews perched like buzzards on rooftops only add to the effect. People file in sl silently and sign in. The reaping is a good opportunity for the capital to keep tabs on the population as well. 12 through 18 years old are headed into roped areas marked off by ages, and the oldest in the front, the young ones like Prim toward the back. Family members line up around the perimeter, holding tightly to one another's hands, but there are others too, who have no one they love at stake, or who would no longer care, who slip among the crowd, taking bets on the two kids whose names will be drawn. Odds are given on their ages, whether they're seam or merchant, if they will break down and weep. Most refuse dealing with the racketeers, but carefully, but carefully, carefully. These same people tend to be informers who, who hasn't broken the law. I could be shot on a daily basis for hunting, but the appetites of those in charge protect me. Not everyone can claim the same. Anyway, Gail and I agree that if we have to choose between dying of hunger and a bullet in the head, the bullet would be much quicker. The space gets tighter, more claustrophobic as people arrive. The square is quite, quite large, but not enough to hold District 12's population of about 8,000. Latecomers are directed to the adjacent streets where they can watch the event on screens as it's televised live by the street. I find myself standing in a clump of 16 of 16s from the seam. We all exchange terse nods that then focus our attention on the temporary stage that is set up before the Justice Building. It holds three chairs, a podium, and two large glass balls, one for the girls and one for the boys. I stare at the paper slips in the girls' ball. Twenty of them have Katniss Everdeen written on them in careful handwriting. Two of the three chairs fill with Madge's father, Mayor Undersea, who's a tall, balding man, and Effie Trinket, District 12's escort, fresh from the Capitol with her scary white grin, pinkish hair, and spring green suit. They murmur to each other, then look with concern at the empty seat. Just as the town cl clock strikes two, the mayor steps up to the podium and begins to read. It's the same story every year. He tells of the history of Panem, the country that rose up out of the ashes of a place that was once called North America. He lists the disasters, the droughts, the storms, the fires, the encroaching seas that swallowed up so much of the land, the brutal war for what little substance, substance remains. The result was Panem, a shining capital ringed by 13 districts, which brought peace and prosperity to the citizens. Then came the dark days, the uprising of districts against the capital. Twelve were defeated, the 13th obliterated. The Treaty of Treason gave us the new laws to guarantee peace, as our yearly reminder that the dark days must never be repeated. It gave us the Hunger Games. The rules of the Hunger Games are simple. In punishment for the uprising, each of the 12 districts must provide one girl and one boy called tributes to participate. The 24 tributes will be imprisoned in a vast outdoor arena that can hold anything from a burning desert to a frozen wasteland. Over a period of several weeks, the competitors must fight to the death. The last tribute standing wins, taking the kids from our districts, forcing them to kill one another while we watch. This is the capital's way of reminding us how, to how totally, totally we are at their mercy, how little chance we would stand at surviving another rebellion. Whatever words they use, the real message is clear. Look how we take your children and sacrifice them, and there's nothing you can do. If you lift a finger, we will destroy every last one of you, just as we did in District 13. To make it, humili to make it humiliating, as well as torturous, the Capitol requires us to treat the Hunger Games as a festivity, a sporting event, pitting each district against the others. The last tribute alive receives a life of ease back home, and their districts will be showered with prizes, largely consisting of food. All year, the capital will show the winning district gifts of grain and oil and even delicacies like sugar, while the rest of us battle starvation. It is both a time for repentance and a time for thanks, intones the mayor. Then he reads the list of past di District 12 victors. In 74 years, we have had exactly two. Only one is alive, Hamish Abernathy, a paunchy middle-aged man who is this moment's 
who at this moment appears hollering something unimaginable, staggers onto the stage and falls into the third chair. He's drunk. Very. The crowd responds with its token applause, but he's confused and tries to give Effie Trinket a big hug, which she barely manages to fend off. The mayor looks distressed. Since all of this is being televised, right now District 12 is the laughingstock of Panem, and he knows it. He quickly tries to pull the attention back to the reaping by introducing Effie Trinket. Bright and bubbly as ever, Effie Trinket trots to the podium, gives her signature. Happy Hunger Games, and may the odds be ever in your favor. Her pink hair must be a wig because her curls have shifted slightly off center since her encounter with Haymitch. She goes on a bit about what an honor it is to be here, although everyone knows she's just aching to get bumped up to a better district where they have proper victors, not drunks who molest you in front of an entire nation. Though the crowd, through the crowd, I spot Gail looking at, back at me with a ghost of a smile. As reapings go, this one is, is, is at least has a slight of entertainment factor. But suddenly I'm thinking of Gail and his 42 names in that big glass ball and how the odds are not in his favor not compared to a lot of the boys. And maybe he's thinking the same about me because his face darkens and he turns away. But there are still thousands of slips. I wish I could whisper to him. It's time for the drawing, Effie Trinket says as she always does. Ladies first, and crosses to the glass ball with the girl's names. She reaches in, digs her hand deep into the ball and pulls out a slip of paper. The crowd draws in a collective breath and then you can hear a pin drop and I'm feeling nauseous and so desperately hoping that it's not me, that it's not me, that it's not me. Effie Trinket crosses back to the podium, smooths the slip of paper, and reads out the name in a clear voice, and it's not me. It's Primrose Everdeen. That's the end of the chapter. Um, so we're going to stop there. Um, so we... If you remember that um, Katniss's little sister's name is Prim, Primrose, so her little sister's name was pulled. Um, we will continue with this next week. Um, I look forward to seeing you guys on our fun Friday Zoom call today at 1030. I can't see what you've done with your projects. Um, don't forget to upload them, on, pictures of them or the actual projects, depending on what you did to the Google Classroom assignment. All right, see you guys later. Bye.